Hello, friends. Uh, welcome back. It's been a while. It is me, Shinge Mavima, and we are back with another lecture in our Pan African Lectures uh, series. But specifically, this goes to that Intro to African History series. As you know, I post videos for that series. That's been the main thing I do. But I post some other videos outside of that series as well. We've had a discussion on COVID and Africa's mm -hmm. reaction to it. We've uh, done a couple other special, uh, special videos. But uh, this one is for the main series, which is the Intro to African History series. And initially I wanted to do, there was a video I wanted to do on this. Uh, so this is, we are focusing on North Africa today. It is a part of Africa that is very much a part of Africa, despite how a lot of people evoke images of, of Black Africa, or they use the term Sub-Saharan Africa to talk about Africa. But indeed, North Africa is a part of Africa. It is, uh, I mean, geographically, of course, it is a part of Africa, but also culturally and, and, and its history is intertwined with the rest of the continent in such a way that any talk that, that aims to speak of it as if it's something separate is, uh, is misguided at best and uh, oftentimes even malicious, right? You know, and we can talk about that a little more later. But I wanted to do this, uh, this video on North Africa right up until uh, the scramble for Africa kicks in. Then I decided, then I realized I hadn't done any background to that. So I came out and, uh, and I wanted to do two videos. Then I came out, as I looked at, the, at my notes today, I realized, you know what, I have enough here for three videos. So it would be best for me to do it as three videos. So we're going we're gonna to have over the next week or two, I'm going to be releasing three videos um hopefully that makes up for all the time i've missed and the first one is today we'll be talking about uh sort of the birth of islam and its early spread across north africa then we will talk about north africa in the immediate aftermath of that to maybe around the 1600s right then we'll take it from there in the third video to right up until the 19th century as the scramble for africa kicks in so this is that first video in that series and without further ado uh, let me see if I can share my screen here, and uh, we will be uh, cooking with gas. Let's see, how do I do this? Here? All right. Man, it's been so long, I forgot how to, to immediately get to it. But would you look at that? We are in business, we are cooking with gas. Let's go. And you'll see me at the end. All right, so the first thing to do, the first event in the series of events happens outside the scope of Africa, right? Uh, it happens in the Middle East, as we know. Um, the first year of the Islamic calendar is in 620 in the common era or what we may call AD, right? Uh, and what happened this year is in the past year or two, uh, the Prophet Muhammad has been spreading his word, has been telling people about his message, has been garnering followers. Now, as you very well know, when you start garnering followers in anything, it's usually deemed, it could be deemed subversive by, um, by authorities. So this leads to him being, you know, his, his life is under threat. So he flees from Mecca to Medina. And that trip, right, that trip to Medina marks sort of what becomes the first year of the, of the Islam. So if you look at the Islamic calendar, this is the first year. And it marks the, the, the year that uh, Muhammad and his followers, few at the time, fled from Mecca to Medina. Okay. They get to Medina and they start rebuilding his stats. He continues recruiting, recruiting or, you know, spreading his message, right? And his followers grow and they grow into this very uh, vociferous army that they end up coming back to Mecca. Uh, they end up starting to spread within 10 years. They're starting to, to make moves across the region, right? Start spreading, start spreading. <clears throat> and what was the appeal of this? First of all, as they spread this word uh, of, of, of Islam, it was an, easier sell to, to the Arab community in general, right? 
And we'll talk a little bit about, about why I'm using the term Arab for now um, to the Arabic community, because the idea of monotheism, right? This belief in one God was not brand new to them. How do we know that? Well, Christianity and Judaism have been around, I mean, Judaism in particular had been around for much longer, right? But Christianity itself has been around for centuries as well by this point. So the idea of, you know, of, of one God and, and so forth. In fact, as we'll see later in some of the places that they went to in these early days, people couldn't even really tell it apart from, they just thought it was another sect of Christianity or, or sect of, 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 of Judaism, right? Of, of an old school belief system that they already knew about. Okay, so, so, so they start to pray. And also it caught on very much because of its uh, relative simplicity, especially at the time. First of all, Islam came across as not being exclusive. Within the Christian structures, you had the hierarchies of the priests. And a lot of times only the priests were, were reading the word and sharing it with the masses and so forth, right? Um, Islam sort of came across as a, as a mass movement and people could be could participate in it. Secondly, there was less, there was what was perceived to be less heresy. By that I mean there were debates among Christian communities about uh, the nature of, 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 you know, what is the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit? Is, is Jesus God? Is he man? Is he, what is his role in this? There's debates around that. There have been debates in um in the Mauritania earlier, after they had been after the Christians had been persecuted, and there was a group known as the Donatists, who felt that, uh, led by Donatus, right, who felt that any Christians who had forsaken the religion under 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 Roman oppression um, before the conversion by by Constantine had to be could not be readmitted into the church. Right. So, you, you know, but that's earlier. But what I'm saying is there was precedence for debates and schisms within uh, Christian. In fact, the Coptic Church of Egypt had split from the Roman Church over some of these debates. So here comes this religion that says, you know what, all you have to do is pray to God and, 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 and read this book. You're in. So the, it was perceived to be less heresy. So because of all these factors, this religion catches on like a house on fire. Uh, and spreads um, wildly across the across the um, across uh, from Arabia into North Africa, such that by within a hundred years of this founding, they were already ruling all the way to most or to Morocco, which, if you look on this map, is all the way down here. And for some reason, when I did this, I put in uh, in, in Google Maps. Turns out it takes uh, 112 hours to drive there, you know, from, from where they established the religion to Morocco. But also they're in Spain, they get into Spain, so they're also in Europe. And we'll talk a lot about that. One thing that Islam does is it adds a new spirit of Arab brotherhood beyond just language, right? These people have been speaking this language, but they're, you know, ethnically the same, you know, they speak the same language, but it, it, it is what it is, right? But adding the layer of Islam to, to, to the peoples added this layer of, of identifying of cause, right? So, so they start to, um, it elevates sort of their, 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 their feeling of brotherhood as they move forward. Oh, and so what I meant to talk about is here, as you can tell, I say the Arab invasions here, which is what is typically called, um, but as we very well know, Arab, and Islam are not synonymous, right? It's very important to remember this. In fact, the biggest Muslim country in the world is Indonesia. And those folks are not, are not Arabic, right? The Indonesians are not, are not Arabic. Uh, other big uh, Muslim countries include uh, Iran, which is Persia, not Arab. Uh, you can look at even countries such as uh, Senegal, Nigeria, West African countries that have uh, dominant um, Muslim populations. Right, but they're 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 uh, these are these are black Africans. They're definitely not Arab. Uh, so I say this to emphasize that that disambiguation is not just uh, trivial, right? In fact, it's actually caused a lot of uh, tension a lot of times where people who are, you know, just misidentification and so forth, especially in the post 9/11 era. But also, so why have I done that here? Well, in the early days, it is very important to know that in the early days. Uh, 
these identities were, they were not synonymous, but the Arab, the Muslim population at the time that, that rode with, um, with the prophet was, was mostly Arab and it grew around parameters of, 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 of uh, Arabic brotherhood, Arabian brotherhood then soon you'll see the inclusion of the Berbers and so forth. So I just wanted to, to explain that before we proceed. So what happens? So they march into Egypt, right, by 650. Now bear in mind that this religion is only 18 years old at this point. It's incredible. It's incredible, right? And when we say 18 points, we are being generous because remember 622 was the year that they were born, but they, they were only just fleeing with a, few, with a few folks, you know? So, what happens? They get into uh, Egypt and surprisingly Egypt for all its glory has passed and so forth is conquered pretty easily. You can watch the last video I made on um, on Axum, Nubia and, and, and those to sort of tell the dynamics of Egypt that lead directly to, the, to, to, to this moment. But they, you know, it's pretty easy. Why? A large part of this is the Egyptians offered very little resistance. Why is this? Well, they were very much uh, frustrated and hated. They they were under Byzantine rule, and Byzant By Byzantium is a, is a, is the Eastern Roman Empire, right? Um, so just to talk a little bit about that, is the Eastern Roman Empire. The Western Roman Empire had fallen two centuries prior to this, and although the Roman state continued and its traditions were maintained, uh, modern historians distinguish Byzantium from ancient Rome. In, a so, in so far as it was centered in Constantinople, right? As opposed to, to, to Rome and oriented towards Greek instead of Latin culture. Um, you know, it was also characterized by East, Eastern Orthodox church, um, right? So it's, it's different from the old school Rom, uh, Roman empire, but still it's, 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 it's Eastern, Roman, uh, Eastern Roman rule. So why did the Egyptians not offer no resistance? Well. Byzantine rule was very, very brutal, right? It was very, very brutal. Violent uh, repression, you know, including, uh, you, know, so, you know, no religious liberties per se. Um, also very heavily taxed, right? That's other reason. But also remember that because like I said, as Islam grew, people didn't really know what it was. So a lot of Christians, you know, who might have been on the fence about things, I actually didn't, couldn't see much difference between this religion of this book and this religion of that other book, right? It was all one God. And again, a lot of the prophets referenced in Islam uh, feature in, um, in Christianity as well. You have people like uh, Musa in the Quran, who is, who is, who is Moses. You have um, Dawood, who is David, uh, Ibrahim, right? Ibrahim, you know, out of, from Abraham. Um, and so forth, you know, even Jesus himself features as Issa, although his status is, is, is as a prophet in Islam and not in, you know, of course, as a, as a, as a God, um, as part of the Trinity in, um, in Christianity. But in any case, so it was easily, you know, they didn't even feel like they were drastically changing their religion at the time. So this allowed them to, 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 to come in and by 642, uh, they had conquered, uh, they would expelled the Byzantines and mo actually moved the capital from Alexandria to Cairo, which at this point becomes the capital of the Islamic world, something that would grow further and further with the likes of Saladin uh, five centuries from now. But we'll get to talking about that. However, in all this, as they spread, the logical next step might have been to get into Nubia. So, so they broke into Nubia. Remember, Mero had recently just fallen at this point, the, 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 the Nubian kingdom of, of Mero had just fallen at this point. But so they went in and they found a dogged Christian Nubian resistance at this point, dogged Christian resistance, um, actually tried to break in twice, I believe in six, six um, I can't remember the years now, but in the second part of the seventh century, they tried to break into, oh, here we have it, 641 and 651, they tried to break into, into, into Nubia and they were defeated in both battles, uh, the battle of Dongola, that's what those battles are called. And actually, so they decided to step away from it for now, 
um, and they created a peaceful treaty between Islamic Egypt and Christian Nubia uh, after having failed to break into uh, Nubia, which is modern day Sudan. Large parts of Nubia would eventually convert, but that's, uh, that's for, for later we'll talk about. But at this point, they were able to resist and keep the keep the um, the uh, Muslim Egypt at bay. So after conquering Egypt, after having struggled with Nubia, the struggle continues. So they are moving into what we call the Maghreb. Now the Maghreb is really just this area here uh, to the to the to the to, the, to, the, to the west of Egypt. Which you know usually when people talk about about uh, about the Maghreb, they're talking about Algeria, Morocco, Tunisia, even maybe Libya sometimes. Um, so they spread out here, and among the goals of the of the of the of the of the rampaging Muslim as they spread across um, was uh, to conquer the province of Carthage, the Roman province of Carthage, uh, modern day Tunisia, right? Uh, you know. It's what the Romans called Africa. That was the province that they referred to as Africa. So when, when they conquered Carthage, the African province, right? That's what they were referring to, also known by the Arabs as Ifriqiya, which we theorize that's where the name Africa comes from. Um, and they went in there and they faced slightly stiffer resistance than they had in Egypt, right? This is this, the people they come upon here are mainly the Berbers. Now the Berbers. Are a different lot, right? They were they had never stopped fighting against uh, Byzantine rule. Um, they just wanted their autonomy. They just wanted their autonomy. So what you get here is they are not only fighting against the Byzantines who are still trying to keep control of the area, but they are also fighting against the Berbers who also want who say, you know what, screw uh, Byzantine rule and screw. Uh, you know, Muslim rule, right? Or Arabic rule at this point. So they put up a dogged fight, but I eventually conquered uh, by, you know, the, the Byzantines are expelled, of course, but the Berbers are eventually conquered in 711, uh, you know, 711 in the common era, um, at which point the, uh, the, the Muslim community that had now spread here is, you know, the Arab who at this point uh, rampaging through the area established the, uh, a new capital city, which was Tunis next to Carthage. So they moved the capital from Alexandria to Cairo in Egypt. Then a bit later, they do the same, moved it from Carthage to Tunis in, um, in modern day Tunisia, right? So that's the spread to the Maghreb. So what was the nature of their rule in this, in this area? So, North Africans who they conquered, the Berbers and so forth, the Egyptians, for the most part were given one of three choices. For the most part, uh, this was either to be heavily taxed, i.e. pay, to convert to Islam or to die, all right? So it sounds pretty stark, right? But the, the, the intention here you might think for a new religion is to just convert a lot of people. No, not really. They were pretty comfortable letting people keep practicing their own religion. If anything, in many cases, they might have actually preferred that because what did that mean? These people don't want to die. So it meant that they got money. You know, they were taxed. The people were heavily taxed uh, uh, this way. And this gave, of course, the North African Muslims an advantage. Why is that? Well, because they it gave them an economic advantage because they didn't have to convert. Uh, you know, once they converted, you know, they didn't have to, 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 to be taxed and so forth. So other groups that were being taxed, these guys are saving up their money and doing better and better. Um, the Berbers now provide, prov proved a different sort of challenge because for a long time, the Berbers were not, this is like rural communities. They're sort of doing their own thing, very hard to control. So, and actually fought diligently, right? Such that they maintained the Muslims at the coast and, and in, the, in the periphery of, the, of, the, of their spaces for a long time. Um, but a lot of them ended up being enslaved as the, as the, as the, as the Muslim armies got stronger. 
um, as well as some other people from um, what we call the, what was called then the, the Western Sudan at the time, different from the country, but we're talking about that whole region where modern uh, Mali, Chad and so forth are. Some people were also uh, captured from there. Um, and a lot of those who were enslaved eventually joined the army. Now, when you join the army, because to be part of this Muslim army, of course, you had to convert. So a lot of them were coming in just to be part of the army and to, to escape enslavement. But you had to take the, you had to convert or you had to declare your allegiance to, to Muslim values. So this is how a lot of how a lot of the Berbers became Moors. Uh, I mean, became Muslims, right? Became Muslim at this point, and eventually they become part of this army, of 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 of, of this army and this community of Muslim Berbers in North Africa. That would be a large part of the group that would become called, uh, known as Moors. Some of you would have heard about Moors before. We'll talk briefly about them. But right now, I think it's just important to touch on something you'll hear a lot when, when people talk about Islam. If you're if you're Muslim, of course, this should come as a no-brainer. For most of you, even if you're not, you should know this already. But uh, in 632, there's a split in, 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 in Islam, right? Um, Right, very. You know, it's, it's very, this is very early into the religion, after after the passing of of um, of uh, Muhammad, right? And actually, looking at this date, I, you know, I think it might have happened a little bit later than this. Uh, let me just quick verify that. But you know, the date, you know, it happens. In the in the seventh century, and I think that's important. But I'm also I also realize that this is a history. Uh, this is a history channel, and I would be remiss. So I'm quick looking up the date here just to make sure that I got you. I got you in. Uh, uh, I got the right information for you. All right, yeah, so 632 is correct. Yeah, I should trust myself more. 632, you know, after Muhammad dies, right? There's debates about who should, how the religion, how the, you know, how Islam should continue. And there's two groups. The first, the first one, the larger one today is the Sunni who believe that uh, the first four caliphs, you know, was, were uh, the early leaders of the movement, you know, while Muhammad was still around. Could, could continue leading the religion. They were rightly guided, right? The Sunni, it sort of refers to the way, right? As long as you, in a nutshell, as long as you continue to walk according to the Quran, that's okay. So no, so as you, as expected, that group is the far bigger one, right? They believe that Muslim rulers should follow the Sunnah or Muhammad's example. That's 83% of the population according to this chart. Um, the Shia, on the other hand, believe that Ali, who was uh, the prophet's son-in-law by way of his daughter uh, Fatima, ought to succeed Muhammad, okay? Um, and believe that, so as a result of that, they believe that all Muslim leaders should be descendants of Muhammad, right? Not this sort of sooner, more uh, open way. So as you can, as you would expect as well, because it's a more radical standpoint, um, 16% of the, of the population, uh, of the Muslim population uh, belong to the Shia group. The other groups as well, including, including such, you know, such groups as the Kajites, who at the time were Muslim Berbers and other, and other people who were not Arab and sort of resented the quote unquote supremacy, Arab supremacy in the Maghreb, you know. Then you also have several different groups within the Sunni and the Shias, right? But we can get, you know, that's not the topic of this, but some of the groups will become more important going forward, such as the Sufis, when we get to talking about pre-colonial Morocco and, and so forth. All right. So we mentioned the Moors earlier. Who are these Moors? You hear this name a lot thrown around in popular culture. Some groups even call themselves the Moors. Um, and yet you might, you know, in history books, especially in textbooks, there's uh people don't really get to talking about the Moors, so we're just gonna spell out who the Moors are real quickly, okay, and and what their relevance is. So here we have the 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 the, the name is of Roman origin. The name is of Roman origin, right? Um, and initially just meant 
you know, people from the region of Mauritania. Now, people might be tempted to say people from the region of Morocco because the name kind of sounds like that, but actually it's it was the 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 the, the Roman name for people from Mauritania, right? Mauritania. So this is this region here, uh, beginning in the Maghreb and going a little bit, uh, you know, on the northwest of Africa. There's the modern country of Mauritania, of course, but in other spaces around there as well, Mauritania. So the the people from here, that was that was the Roman name. Uh, however, as the, as Islam spread, and especially with the conquest. The Iberian of the Iberian Peninsula in 7, 7 11, common era or ED, AD as we call it, more soon began to mean uh, to be a name for just for 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 either Muslim people, mainly for Muslim people, um, but also a lot of other people were dark skinned with just thought of as, as Moors. I don't know if you guys have ever seen the movie Black Knight or something like that with. Uh, with Martin Lawrence when he goes back in time and one of the people saw him and they're like oh he's a Moor you know because yeah, they didn't have any uh, you know of course uh, an African-American was way out of place in this area he's a Moor you know I didn't get it at the time because I was a kid but I'm like oh that's what they were referring to so for example Europeans at the time would even distinguish between black Moors and white Moors blacker Moors or white Moors right just if you're a Muslim uh, and so forth so in 711, right, which I which I hinted at earlier, the Berbers, as part of the expression, they, they go into Morocco and they go into the Iberian Peninsula, right, led by General Tariq ibn Zayed, right? General Tariq ibn Zayed, uh, Zayed. and for the next 700 years, uh, there is Muslim rule, Moorish rule of, um, of the Iberian Peninsula, or what they we call our Andalus, our Andalus, right? You might hear of Andalusian cheese or something like that. Our Andalus, that's what the area was called in, in Arabic, right? Uh, our Andalus. And so, like I said, the name grew to mean anybody who was uh, dark skinned or was Muslim. Uh, in fact, later on, when the, when the Portuguese would go and try to in, uh, invade East Africa, Kenya, that area, the, the, the Sahel, the Swahili, sorry, the Swahili coast, uh, they, they situated that as the conquest of, as a jihad against those Moors, which, you know, East Africa, and for a large parts of it, Southeast Africa is, is far, far away from Northwest Africa, where, from the Maghreb, from where the Moors originally came from, but they were just saying this, Partly as justification for their invasion, but also just to show that they lumped all people of Muslim faith together. So, and this era is also known as an era of much prosperity for the Europeans. I'll put some sources in the description, but you know, this is the era that many, many developments came to, to Europe, right? So for example, things like uh, public libraries were proliferated in this region. The number zero, which was uh, not part of of of, uh, of Greek mathematics, is added to 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 uh, to discourse algebra, right? That R in algebra, you know, is 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 a is a is a signifier of its Arabic origins, like R this and that. Algebra is introduced. Things like uh, chemistry. There's huge developments in astronomy. And so forth as a result, you know, I said public libraries, but even sanitation, man, public baths. At this point, the culture of, 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 of showering was very different, you know, in, in, in Europe at the time. But the great sanitation practices are introduced as well. There are so many things that the, that the Europeans, I mean, that the Moors introduced to, uh, to, to, to Europe by way of the Iberian Peninsula at this time. All right, so that's a little bit about the Moors. Now back to Africa. This is this is a fascinating one here, right? Because in that same region uh, of Morocco, right, where where the Berbers are, what happens to these guys? So some elements of Islam had had indeed spread across the Saharan Berber populations. 
but the practice of the religion was, was still pretty far from orthodox. The, Berber, um, the first real step towards the establishment of Islam was to take place in the region of modern day Mauritania, right? Which we just spoke about in the early 11th century. So here's what happens. In 1035, a chief from the Lamtuna Berbers, right? Uh, went on, on the Hajj and the Hajj is the trip that, that, that Muslims make to Mecca. You know, you have to make it at least once in your lifetime, I believe. Um, so, you know, he took on, he went on this trip in 1035. And as he went over there, he realized that how Islam was being done in these other places, you know, he's traveled right across all the way to, um, to Mecca, right? And he's just blown away by how, um, how the religion is practiced in these different places and how much he's, now remember the Berbers, they were just kind of doing their own thing, right? Mecca's in Saudi Arabia, by the way. So that's a long trip. So he goes there and he sees how, how devout Muslims live. And he comes back, he's like, man, this, this nomadic Berbers who say they're Muslim, they're not really about that life, man. You know, So he talks to a scholar named Abdullah Ibn Yassin to accompany him you know, he brought him back from Mecca to accompany him to educate his people on the proper practice of the religion. So yeah, first he started off with this thing called the Jihad of the Mouth, where he preached the nature of true Islam to the different groups. Then later on, um, he started to use the Jihad of the Sword, wherein he sought to establish an Islamic state that would foster a more orthodox practice of Islam. And in this, he was very successful, right? He was very successful enter the Almoravids. So Abdallah Ibn Yassin then leads or leads the founding of the Almoravids. Um, indeed, and it, and it continues to grow. You know, it finds reson resonance among the, the Lamtuna and some of its leaders here become prominent fighters. Uh, and one of the things that they actually, the reason it found resonance among these groups is because as, as ancient Ghana spread, some of the Soninke people had claimed some of their territory, right? So they use this as a pretext to fight back. And actually they fought back, reclaimed some of their territory, right? Helped uh, expedite the downfall of, um, of ancient Ghana, which we can talk about ancient Ghana uh, later as well. And resecured control, the Trans-Saharan gold trade, which was something that the, the uh, ancient Ghana had been in charge of for a while, right? So they do that. Um, and actually ended up converting the leaders of ancient Ghana who were Soninke ethnically uh, to Islam by the end of the 12th century. And Ghana at that point was independent and Islamic by the 12th century. One thing that they're also known to, uh, that they're also known for is they are called upon by the, by the Moorish rulers of our Andalus to come and help them to come and help them when the Christians were, were, when the resurgent Christians were trying to push back against them, okay? So, and they, they went in there and they helped them and they actually helped defeat the, uh, the Christians, uh, kept them at bay for another 300 years or so. Well, this, this was important in keeping them at bay for another 300 years or so. That's how more of it. But as we know, people get comfortable, right, in time, the Almoravids, who had also been doing very well, uh, get comfortable, and the Almohads, right, rise up and end up pushing back against them. Uh, you know, the Almohads began as a movement to purify the practice of Islam, which the Almoravids had become decadent. And again, like the like the Almoravids, they also extended into into Spain, where where they unified the region's fractured Muslim states. Right, uh, the, these conquests also added a new chapter into the long-standing process of cultural, economic, and political exchange between Northwestern Africa and the Iberian Peninsula. Um, indeed, so 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 you get this, and they also they spread literacy. Mosques also built by the number. Wait, let me go back to 
sorry, I'm going to go back to slides because I didn't tell you what, what, what building we were looking at here. This is a uh, Mosque Cristo de la Luz, uh, which uh, fell in the 11th. So, you know, it's interesting, right? It's the Mosque of, the, of Christ, the, 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 the Christ the Light. That's what Cristo de la Luz uh, means. Uh, but yes, this was, uh, you know, this was uh, taken by the Christians uh, during that time. No, no, this was taken by the Muslims during that time in, uh, in the 11th century. So that's another legacy. Their, their architecture is also part of their legacy. Um, they spread uh, literacy, right? Mosques were founded across the, the continent. I mean, across the region as sort of madrasas where people would learn to read. You know, people, you would not just be learning about the religion, but as you, as you learn about the religion, you're also learning how to read and so forth. So this helps part of that idea of, of literacy. When I was talking about the, the benefits that Islam rule brought to, to the Iberian Peninsula, literacy is a big one, right? Because up to that point, only the, 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 the you know, it's hard to imagine now, but, like, like access to, to, to books and, and, and literacy was very much a thing of the, of the upper echelons of society. This made it uh, accessible to the masses. Eventually, however, the resurgent Christian kingdoms rise up uh, in, the, in the, what we call the Portuguese Reconquista, um, right? Uh, and pushed back the, 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 the Muslims out of out of uh, Iberian Peninsula. And thus, Muslim rule of Iberia finally ends in 1492, which scholars of history would know is a, is a pivotal year for many other reasons, right? The list of which is not Christopher Columbus making his, his voyage uh, to the Americas. And so this helps us set up uh, in the first few years of, 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 of Islam. We'll come back next week and we'll get into the nitty gritties or next time, and we'll get into the nitty gritties of the, the Ayyubid and Fatimid dynasty. We'll talk about uh, the Mamluks and Saladin and so forth, all that other good stuff. But I thought this would be a great place to get us started in talking about the spread of Islam in, um, in the first couple of centuries of, of its existence. So thank you guys very much. This has been uh, great. I'm glad to be back in front of you today. And uh, you'll see me again soon, indeed.